Now, the RAC says motorists are being overcharged by hundreds of millions of pounds each year due to unfair and illegal parking fines. The organisation estimates that £100 million are paid in fines every year. 57,000 of those are appealed and less than half of those appeals are successful. Well, joining us now to discuss the fines are Barry Siegel, founder of the parking appeal website appealnow.com and Will Hurley, director of the Independent Parking Committee. Before we get started, though, a reminder that you can join the debate as well. Tweet us at Sky News, including the hashtag SkyDebateText on 84501 or email the news at sky.com. Let us know what you think. If there are any points you want to put to our guests here, we'll read some of your comments out as we go along. Gentlemen, very good morning to you. Will Hurley, if I can start with you. We're talking about private car parks here on private land, not, not council-run car parks. Now, we've had emails, tweets in from people yeah. who've been charged in some cases hundreds of pounds fines for staying over perhaps just a couple of minutes. Is there any justification for these? Are they proportionate at all, these fines? I believe there's absolutely no justification well, whatsoever. The law is that the fines have to be a genuine pre-estimate of loss. In other words, what the parking company has lost. Well, what has a parking company lost by somebody overstaying a couple of minutes? Nothing. OK, let me put that point to Will Haley. Well, indeed, yeah, it, it depends. What it's uh, easy to do is um, consider all these parking charges uh, together, but that's not the case. A lot of operators use different models and different methods of enforcing parking charges. What's key is that landowners have got to have the ability to protect their interests in private land and ensure that they can enforce um, against motorists who park otherwise than how they want them to park on their land. Um, it's only uh, an issue um, about breach of contract and damages um, that uh, the gentleman was making reference to uh, in relation to a genuine pre-estimate of loss. Yeah, that's the point, isn't it? So people can't actually be fined for being on this land. What they're actually paying a fine for is potential damage to that land. And how can you say that actually somebody can be fined, as I said, hundreds of pounds for literally parking somewhere. How can you justify, explain that in terms of damage caused to private property? Well, it's not the case that all charges are based in damages. That's what needs to be understood. Um, some companies do um, breach, uh, issue charges for breach of contract, but some companies say that the price of parking for longer than two hours is, two, uh, is £100, for example, or £85 or £75. What needs to be clear is the motorist needs to understand when they park on a private park, car park what the rules and regulations relating to that car park are, and that's all done by having clear signage at the site. And certainly we at the IPC audit every single one of our operators' sites to make sure that the signage is appropriate and to make sure that there is enough of those signs to make it clear to the motorists when they enter what they've got to do to make sure that they don't have to pay the £100 or the £80 for going above and beyond what they're permitted to do on that land. Barry Siegel, you were giving, a, I guess, an ironic laugh there, a little chuckle. Well, £85 to uh, park for an hour... That's just a way of getting round the genuine pre-estimate of loss issue on the contract. And it's outrageous. What's the justification of charging £85? You, you, you can go and get a fantastic dinner for two for £85. This is outrageous. And the fact that uh, Will actually proposes this as something which is acceptable is beyond belief. And I'm sure your viewers are similarly outraged as I am. Well, Hurley, how do the companies come up with these figures for these fines? How is it justified that they could charge 50, 100, in some cases many hundreds of pounds for these uh, people who overstay their welcome? As I said, in some cases well, for a couple of minutes, we've had examples, I'll read some out as well, where one person said they were sat in their car, they actually didn't move from their vehicle and they were still fined by somebody. What we've got to remember is that landowners have got to have rights to protect their land. It is their land, after all, and they're entitled to require people to stay for only two hours if that's what they want to do, and there'll be their own commercial reasons as to why they do that. The Protection of Freedoms Act in uh, 2012 banned clamping and towing away on private land, so now landowners don't have that protection. The only way that they can 
protect people and make sure that people abide by their rules on their land is to enforce these charges and to make sure that the signage is clear. At the end of the day, an operator who puts up a sign that is clear is telling the motorist what they need to do to be able to stay on that land. And if a motorist makes a clear decision to park on that land, it's quite right that they should abide by the rules and regulations imposed by the landowner. Barry Siegel, it is fair enough, isn't it? These are private companies going about their business. As we heard from Will Hurley there, his organisation audits these uh, parking companies to make sure they have clear signage out there. So people are warned, aren't they? Actually, if you go over, if you want to take the chance and you don't and you want to park there for a couple of minutes over what you've actually paid for, then you run the risk of this fine. The onus is on you to make sure you're back at your car and shifted it before, you, before your parking runs out. I understand that, but of course you use the word proportionality and being proportionate, and this isn't proportionate. The other major problem is that the business model of many of these parking companies only works, they only get income if they can catch you out and issue you with a parking ticket. And that, once again, senses, gives the sense to people that they'll do anything to issue the parking ticket because if they don't, they won't get any money. And that's, I think, a very disturbing aspect of the whole private parking industry. Moreover, there's no oversight, there's no legislative oversight, whereas councils who issue parking tickets, there is legislation which they have to abide to. So, Barry Siegel, you want legislation in place now. What do you want it specifically to say? I think it should control these parking companies uh, in a very specific way. I think they should be licensed by the government. The mere fact that they belong to trade organisations which represent them uh, is not enough in my view and I think there should be a limit on the amount of the fines that can be imposed. This is not to say that landowners shouldn't have rights but everything has to be proportionate. Everything in life is proportionate and people know when they're being scammed or being overcharged and it's unfair and the way these tickets are printed many of them look like council parking tickets and people tend to pay up whereas it's not the case and I've got lots of cases. And can I just mention one case which was so outrageous, which came to my notice in December. Uh, a, a gentleman was driving his wife to the doctor. He dropped her off, did a U-turn, and hadn't realized he'd encroached partially on some private land and got a parking ticket for something like 150 pound. He appealed to the company and by return they turned him down. Well, that's not fair. That's not the British understanding of justice. And I can't see how these parking companies can actually justify the charges. OK, I'm going to let Will Hurley come back in just a moment on that. I'm going to just first of all bring in some of your stories, your experiences you've been telling us about. John says a company wrongly categorised my vehicle as a heavy goods vehicle to raise the fine from below £200 to £250 for parking for 120 seconds, that's two minutes. Linda emailed to say I was charged £430 and my car was taken away in Birmingham. I wrote to the government, they couldn't do anything as it was just the law, they said. How can that be legal? One more, Mark argues, I run a pub and suffer from people parking in my car park but not coming in. We're no longer able to stop them leaving by means of a clamp or a barrier. This affects my business. I should be able to charge these people for the problems they cause me. So one person in defence of these car parks and their various charges. Um, Will Hurley, you've got a lot of angry viewers out there and we heard from Brian Siegel one example there, a preposterous situation and there are many of those, that's the problem, that many of these car parks are seen as scams where by people can make extraordinary amounts of money by preying on the vulnerable, the weak people who perhaps make a mistake. Understandably there are people who out there, are out there who don't act in accordance with the way that we would want them to and certainly prior to our existence two years ago there was only one trade association the British Parking Association uh, and a number of operators um, weren't members of those for a number of different reasons what we've done uh, by coming into existence is make it affordable uh, and make it so that more people are to use the term regulated by ourselves or the British Parking Association so less private car parks are governed and, and operated on by operators that have no uh, body to look over them and make sure that they're acting properly and our fees um, in relation to operators and what they can issue are limited to £100 uh, they're reduced by 40% for the first 14 days and a number of operators uh, have lower rates in the first instance. 
Uh, we also have uh, the audits that I mentioned upon. We audit every single site and every single sign. Um, and on top of that, we have an independent appeals process whereby motorists who get issued with a ticket and appeal uh, in much the way described by uh, Mr. Segal um, have the ability to not accept the decision of the operator and put a decision before an independent barrister or solicitor who will make a decision as to whether or not the charge issued was lawful or not. Well, Barry Siegel doesn't think that goes far enough, thinks there should be a change in the law and then you'd be out of a job. What would happen then? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that we'd be out of a job. We provide a lot of work, a lot of advice uh, to our operators uh, and they rely upon that and they'll continue to need to rely upon the advice and assistance that we give them. And we, we pride ourselves on, on providing so much advice and assistance that I think that we still wouldn't have any difficulties. But the reality is that the uh, law is, is there enough to protect the motorist and the landowner. We're going to be given some guidance by the Court of Appeal in the next few weeks as to whether or not the charge is issued for breach of contract can be at the level of, I, I think it's £85 in relation to that case. So we're going to get some gu guidance. It's perhaps the final piece of the jigsaw to make sure um, that motorists know what the position is when they park on private land and operators equally know what they're allowed to do. So once we have that, uh, everything should be in place to make sure that we can ad advise the motorists and educate the motorists in the way that we've spent the last two years educating our operators. All right, Will Hurley, Barry Siegel, very good to talk to you both. Thanks very much for joining in that debate thank and also you. thank you very much for your thoughts this morning.